Hello, this is Scott Jens. Welcome to Sandbox Stories. Hello and welcome to the Sandbox Story, which is an interview with Dr. Larry DeLucas. Dr. DeLucas, I cannot wait to hear about you and your stories on this episode of Sandbox Stories. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, let's start out with your educational achievements. So you're a doctor of optometry, but you have this really long and impressive list of other academic degrees. You got a PhD in biochem. Tell us about your path at the U University of Alabama, Birmingham toward those two doctorate degrees. So I, I actually, you know, like a lot of college students, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I had had two years of high school chemistry, and I, I knew I liked chemistry, so I decided, well, I'll major in chemistry. So I got a bachelor's in chemistry to start with, and I still didn't know, do I want to, you know, continue? And I actually had no confidence that I could ever be a scientist, um, but I was lucky um, because of the two years of high school chemistry. I skipped the first year of college chemistry. I think you call it clepping out, you know, you take an exam. So I did well on that, but then I started with organic chemistry and the teacher, I did, I did well on the first couple exams and, and the teacher was a polymer chemist. He came up and said to me, would you like to work for me? And I, I was shocked. I mean, I had absolutely no confidence to, to do anything like that. And I needed some extra money. So I said, yes. And so I worked part time for him and I made mistakes. I remember one time I flooded the lab. You know, I didn't uh, wire a hose on a condenser. Um, and, you know, he wasn't real happy about that. But, you know, over time, you know, he was always telling me how to do everything. And then as I got a little confidence, I started saying, what if we tried to do it like this? And he would let me try things and they didn't always work. But when they did, I gave me more confidence. And so I thought, OK. Maybe I can go get a master's degree. I still didn't think a PhD was for me. And so, so I went toward a master's degree. And for that, you have to do a dissertation, uh, you know, research. And so um, I took a computer course and the person teaching it was actually a postdoc at UAB. And, and he was into a field called X-ray crystallography. And, you know, I learned a little bit about it, but not much. And so he took me to the lab and I got intrigued and decided from my thesis, I would do the structure of some small molecules that are involved in how teeth and bone calcify. And so I did that. And um, at UAB, and I guess at most schools, they have a competition called Sigma Psi competition for graduate students. You can present your research and back then, I think as a winner, you get $500. It's probably much more now. But, you know, I decided to, to, to compete and I won first place. And, and that gave me more confidence that maybe I could go for a PhD. And so I started at, on a PhD. And right at that time, the field of crystallography was changing. Um, the person that ran the, the lab there, uh, had just come back from a sabbatical in Oxford, England, uh, where he learned that you could use crystallography not for little molecules like I worked on, but for big proteins. And so I always liked biology, and I thought, wow, this is what I want to do for my PhD. So I, I worked, started to work there on my PhD, entered graduate school for the PhD, and they had five postdocs in that lab and none of them could find a job in protein crystallography. Why? No one was doing it. You know, there were only, a, UAB was the first university in the whole Southeast that, that was doing this. And, and I think uh, up north, it, of course, MIT was doing it, uh, maybe Caltech, but there, and companies where you might want to get a, a higher paying job, none of them were doing it because to do the structure of a protein back then took 15 years for a small protein. Wow. And so I thought, you know, why am I doing this? Uh, someday I'd like to get married and, you know, I, I don't want to spend five, six years as a postdoc, you know? And so, 
So I was going to drop out of graduate school and just try to find any job. And uh, I, I always played basketball in high school. I loved sports. And so I went to the gym one night to play basketball and I'm running full court. And I knocked this older guy over. His his name was Jerry Christensen. And uh, it turned out he was the dean of student affairs at the School of Optometry. And I helped him up, put his glasses back on for him, you know, and he, he was kind of dazed. But we, we started talking and I told him that, you know, he asked me what I was doing. And I told him and he said, have you ever thought about a combined degree? We need people in optometry looking at vision, looking at vision related molecules. So if you could do the two, have that expertise and get a doctorate of optometry, you won't have to do a postdoc. We'll hire you immediately. And so that's what I did. And uh, of course, in optometry, you learn a lot about optics. And if you want, you can go to summer school, take extra courses and get a, a, another bachelor's degree in physiological optics. So I did that too. So I ended up with five degrees. And, you know, my father kept saying, when are you going to get a job? But, you know, it took a while to go through all this. But that, that, that's, that's how my career started. Really amazing. That's awesome. Let's talk about your family. You were born in Syracuse, and your dad's work caused you to move something like 13 times. You ended up graduating from Tucker, Georgia, before you ended up in Birmingham. Your dad was a World War II veteran. What was that story about? Boy, you know, when I started in college, I was in ROTC, and, and I wanted to be a Green Beret. They actually had a Green Beret that was kind of mentoring us. And I joined this special group called the Counter Gorillas, where most of them do, you know, go, you know, try to become Green Berets. Not everyone makes it, obviously. And, and my father had never talked about the war um, until that was the year, uh, my sophomore year, that you signed. You know, and 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 why why would you do it? Well, if you go in with with the you know ROTC background, you go in as a lieutenant. Otherwise, you're going to go in if they're drafted as a private. And so so I was all gung ho to do this. And that was the year they came up with the lottery, and my number came up 267, which meant I'm probably not going to be selected, right? Based on the lottery, your number's too high. And so that's the only time my father talked about what happened. And he was in a company, I think a company has about 200 men and six of them survived. And the reason it happened, it was pouring down rain and my dad had a machine gun. And every time they heard what he said is the MM88s, these are tank shells, uh, the German MM88s, they whistle when they come through the air. Well, oh, sorry. They whistle when they come through the air. And, and so they would throw their gun down and jump on their gun, you know, to, to kind of hide from it. And, uh, you know, so at one point, he and five others got in this big kind of trench. And they looked up, and here came, came about 400 Germans running toward them, firing away. And my dad went to fire back. He was the only one with a machine gun and it wouldn't fire. It jammed. I guess the mud had gotten in it or something. And so they all kind of just threw their guns out and the Germans came up and trying to decide, do we just shoot them or take them? And fortunately they took them, but then he was in a prisoner of war camp for six months. Well, I'm telling that whole story because he told me that first, but then he, he kind of told me something that I kind of had learned in my training and, and it was, as a unit, if you train really hard, the unit itself does better. But who in the unit survives in a war? It's God. You know, it's luck. I mean, it's just that's the way it is. And, and I remember in my training when he told me that we did what's called field training exercises where we went out and played army in the woods, you know, with blanks in our gun, of course. And the person monitoring, they grade you. He said he told me to stop. And he said, from here for the next 300 yards, the field is booby trapped. So it's up to you to find those traps and not, you know, blow yourself up. And I started walking. And at one point he said, stop. You don't see that wire? And I looked, what wire? The only way you could see it is get down and look up toward the sky. 
you know, and so I would have killed myself. And I was think I think it was that training and what my dad told me. I decided, okay, I'm I'm not going to sign up. And of course, with the lottery and the high number, I did I didn't get chosen. So I ended up not going into the military. But it was mainly my dad that basically begged me not to. <laughs> now my what do you say? Go ahead. I was going to say my older brother. You know, was in the military for I think thirty five years, and uh, you know he graduated a, a full colonel. But but anyway, that that's not the way my route went. <laughs> what do you think of your dad's generation being referred to as the greatest generation? Oh, I, I believe it. You know, when you so I, I'm in a I do an awful lot in STEM, but I also um, I'm part of a program. I've been part of this program here in Birmingham that covers a lot of Alabama. Um, it's called the Youth Leadership Development Program. It's all about not, not science and technology. It's teaching young students how to become leaders. And so we bring in every year, this is the most amazing part of this. We Last year and this year again, we'll have six or seven Congressional Medal of Honor winners there. They tell the students their stories. And you'll see boys in high school tearing up as they hear these stories, what these people did to win that Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, and, and, you know, that generation, and, and a lot of them were in the Vietnam War, you know. Now, my dad, of course, was World War II. But that, that generation and, and what people did, the sacrifices for this country, uh, I, I hope if it ever happens again, we'll have those kind of people. I'm not sure. I think we're yeah. becoming cream puffs, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and what's really heartening, I guess, from, from my perspective uh, is to see the young men and women who seem to be willing to continue to commit to military service. And I think sometimes it's because of stories like your dad's. Maybe they had a grandfather, an aunt, or an uncle who's done something. And, and now we've got, you know, this uh, generation of World War II vets passing us uh, like we did the Korean War vets. So it seems like every 10 or 12 years we've got another, but uh, yeah. hopefully um, the, the leadership of, of these young people will carry us through. You talked about your brother being a big achiever. He was the firstborn. Most of the firstborns <laughs> go on and do this, went to the military. Yeah. You've also had a, a brother and a sister. Uh, there's four of you. Yes. Yeah. Has it been hard without seeing each other much this past year? Well, we, we do a lot on Zoom, you know, so we yeah. have, uh, uh, um, actually, we play games on Zoom together, things like that. So that's been helpful. But yeah, we're all far apart. And what I really miss right now are my grandchildren. So I have four of them. And, you know, because I just got my first shot this morning for COVID. And so until we're protected, my kids don't want to bring the grandchildren. They're afraid they might infect us, you know, and I am 70 now. And so so, um, you know, we're, we're, we're hopeful in about a month we're going to get to see everybody again, all the grandchildren. So back to the optometry background. So you knocked over the dean on the basketball court and you got involved in optometry and in, um, you know, biochemistry. And I'd like just to focus for a moment on your work as a clinical faculty at UAB. You've really been long term involved in optometric education. Has that given you any sort of uh, you know, long lasting effect? I'm sure it has to be positive in many ways. So. You know, the, the background you get as an optometrist um, and, and, you know, I always tell people I love research. I love being in the lab. I like trying to come up with a new invention. And I've had many patents, you know, because of that. But but uh, working with people and the combination of doing that while I did research, um, it, it helped me so much because. We usually, as the faculty, got people that, as patients, that weren't happy somewhere else. And they came, and, and if I could solve their problem and have them go out happy, it made my, my month, you know? So you feel so good. And I often would get a basket of flowers or something, fruit, you know, because of patients being happy for the way we took the care that, that they weren't getting probably elsewhere. Um, you know, and, and so it, it meant a lot to me to have that combination. It really helped me also when things weren't going well with my research, 
because I yeah. knew I could spend that day in the optometry uh, clinic and either teach students and see patients benefit from that or in my own practice a half day a week, you know, help people myself. And so so it, it meant a lot in in, in the first, you know, I guess uh, I, I practiced not that long. It was about 12 years of practice. So this protein crystallography expertise led to, if I counted them right in your CV, 30 plus, 31 patents. A lot of us that are involved in clinical optometry on a day-to-day -day healthcare basis don't understand how that might uh, be used to positively affect the delivery of medicine. Can you bring some practical storytelling around what protein crystallography does today in medicine? Um, pretty much every major. So, so I, I think I mentioned that the problem when I first started in protein crystallography is that it took 15 years to do a structure. Today, if you have a good crystal of the protein, you have to grow a crystal of it to use this technique, the next day you can have the structure. And so now pharmaceutical companies use that structure because what you get when you determine the structure with crystallography is the position of every, every amino acid, every atom on the amino acid within hundreds of an angstrom. And so once you have that, you can understand how one protein interacts with another, but also, you know, all diseases pretty much are based on proteins, either in bacteria or viruses that infect us, or, or just proteins in your body that aren't working right, chronic diseases. And so, so if you have the structure, you can design a drug on a computer that should fit in there, and everywhere there's a positive point on, on an enzyme that's responsible, say, for a bacteria to replicate, you can block it so it won't work right, right? And so having that structure helps you tailor make drugs. It, it, it's kind of um, accelerated drug discovery tremendously. And if you can make a drug based on the structure that fits like a key going in a lock and with the right charges, then you minimize the chance that that drug will have side effects by affecting other proteins. And so this is called structure-based drug design. And every pharmaceutical company and many, many universities today use this technique to develop new pharmaceuticals. Wow. So in our background discussions, you gave me the summary that you had this realization that the lack of gravity could help improve the quality protein crystals, and that would be a key for protein crystallography. So you went through a series of events and connections, and your reputation grew in this field, and suddenly you're a candidate to become a NASA astronaut. I would really love for you to tell us how you competed for that opportunity. Um, don't want to go through that again, but but uh, <laughs> so for the... The, I, I applied, tried to get selected in the, so the way it works as a payload specialist, so that's what I was, so you're doing science, um, is on, on the flight that I got selected for, there were 31 experiments. Each of those scientists that's the principal investigator of those 31 different experiments gets to nominate two people to, to be the payload specialist. So there are about 60 people nominated. Then they look at your resume as a group, the 31 scientists, and they narrow it to the top 12. Um, those 12 people, this is what happened, at least for my flight. Uh, we all went to Houston to take a three-day physical. Two people failed. The 10 that passed the physical come back, and now they narrow it to two people. Those two people have to compete for the next year. So for that next year, I went to all the universities that had these experiments on the flight that I was hopefully going to be selected for. Some of, some of the scientists were at NASA centers. So we went to NASA Glenn in Cleveland, for example, Marshall Space Flight Center. So those scientists that had experiments, you know, would teach us in a classroom. They'd take us in the lab and show us how to do the experiment. Then we'd have to do it while they film us to see if we're doing things right. At the end of a year, now you take basically a final exam with those 31. And so they're in a semicircle and I'm in the middle and they can ask you about the theory. Um, so even with my five degrees, I never learned much about fluid dynamics, 
combustion science. So all of a sudden, I was worried because the person I was competing with, you know, actually had a background in combustion science and in crystal growth. And so I actually had friends of mine. One was the person that taught optics at the School of Optometry. Before he did that, his name was Bill Rosenblum. Before he did that, he was a NASA physicist. And so he knew fluid dynamics. So he would tutor me on weekends when I'd come home from the different places. So that's what I was doing to compete. But anyway, in the end, I was lucky enough to, to be selected. And the nice story, the second, the person I competed against, he becomes the backup. So he has to keep training and he supported me. He was in mission control. When I'm up in flight, if a malfunction occurs, he helps me, you know, go through it and correct whatever's wrong. And we had some of those. We actually had a fire on, on my flight. So, so, um, so that person, the nice end of the story, uh, applied again a few years later. And on a related mission, he got selected. And I, I was one of the scientists that had a vote. And I made sure that he was going to get selected by convincing everybody else. But so we're very good friends now. But, but during the competition, you know, we were both trying to be selected. So maybe not as friendly as we are now. <laughs> I think of it like, you know, the two prime candidates for quarterback on a football team, <laughs> you know, they want the other one to succeed, but yeah, uh, that's really interesting. It. Yeah. it was, it was space shuttle. It was STS 50. What year was that? So we flew in 1992. We, we launched in on June 25th and came back. We, we were supposed to come back on, on July 8th uh, because of a hurricane right over Edwards Air Force Base in California. We, we stayed up an extra day. I guess the good news about that is uh, um, we were done with the science. And that's when, if you ever see astronauts having fun, that's when we could play around and look out the window or do some funny things. And I love basketball. NASA let me take a basketball, uh, kind of a plastic goal with suction cups. And I put it on the wall and I had a Nerf ball about that big and spun it you know, with my finger on top and then did some flips in the air and ripped the goal off the wall as I slam dunked it. So, That's awesome. so we got to have some fun that last day. Yeah, thank, thank goodness for a hurricane. I guess, I don't know if yeah, that makes sense. I guess. But, and at that time, that was one of the, if not the longest mission that the space shuttle had flown. It was. That set the record. And actually, the person that was my backup is the person that beat their group. When he flew again uh, later, you know, they beat our record by about a day. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, I mean, and, the space shuttle never was up more than, I think, 15 days. You were about 14? 14. Yeah. 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 The reason well, is, you know, when you stay in space that long, and, and again, this is where my medical training from optometry, I knew all this, but it's really nice as we went, because I had to be trained on this too, but I knew this stuff cold. You know, we have little bearer receptors in our body. And if I bend over and stand up quickly, they send a signal to your heart, beat harder. We got to get blood to the brain. Well, if you go up in space for 14 days, now that mechanism completely shuts off. So now as we start to come back to earth and gravity pulls the blood that is shifted upward back down to your legs, if your heart doesn't beat harder, you can pass out. And of course, the taller you are, the further you have to pump that blood to get it to, to your head to keep you from passing out. So I always tell people the best person to fly the space shuttle will be a little short, fat guy with high blood pressure, and you do have to be healthy. But but uh, but but anyway, yeah. So so it's kind of you know helpful for me. I, you know, I'm only five nine, um, so I'm short. But I was the tallest person on our crew. It's the only time in my life people ask me to reach up and get things. You know, so, on the Earth. In space, it didn't matter. <laughs> what, what was this like after getting that selection and the flight in, in 92? What was the training like? That had to be fascinatingly different because you're now being given this opportunity to go into a world that isn't really your core world, but you need the training because you're part of this mission. I'd be right. really interested in some of the highlights of that. Yeah. Um, so after that first year, now... We both, the backup and myself, we have to move our, our, our family to Houston. NASA lets you pick out a home as long as it's not too too expensive. And so I had three children. I was married at the time, three children, still am. And uh, 
Um, and so now the training is mostly all about the space shuttle. And, you know, I had to learn about the mainframe computers, which on the space shuttle is 1960 technology. Um, if there's an audience out there watching that's old enough, they may remember the PDP-8 computer where you have to put a ticker tape in. We actually had one of those on the space shuttle. I couldn't believe it. But and I often asked, I did ask the commander, why don't they upgrade the computers? And his first answer was they work. <laughs> the ones they have and, and the second one is you know it would cost a lot and since it works they just kept using that technology all the computers for the science are the latest but not 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 for the space shuttle itself so you know to answer your question we were learning all about the mainframe computers we're learning about the emergency procedures if we you know after challenger if something goes wrong so we're going up not an explosion i don't think we ever would have got out although we do practice that but let's say we're going up and a main engine just turns off and we don't have enough energy to get to orbit we're too far away to try to come back and land so what we do is jettison the rocket the, the fuel tank and the rocket the rockets and so now the shuttle it's not a glider it's heavy it's coming down about like that and so while it's coming down, we get up out of our seat, go over to the hatch. The hatch will explode off the shuttle. And then you slide down this pole that gets you below the wing, you know, and parachute into the ocean. And so we did, you know, um, what's called parasailing, where we go up to 500 feet. And then I hit the clip and it releases me and I would parachute into the ocean. And then in my backpack, I had a a raft that I pull out, blow it up with a CO2 cartridge, get in it, and then it's called water survival training. So I'm all by myself in the middle of the Atlantic, no, can't see the crew. I'm all by myself, and, and I stayed out there, I don't know, it was about 12, 14 hours, and then with a, wow. a radio, you vector a plane in to come find you, and once they locate you, then a helicopter comes and lowers this kind of sinker. You grab it, and the helicopter is like 12 feet above you. And so I had my visor up, and the water's going up into my nose. But I love that kind of stuff. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, we also have to get in a centrifuge and do the shuttle profile, which is only about three and a half Gs for about eight minutes or so. But but um, then they say you want to see how tough you are. And so I'm very competitive and I said, sure. And so I'm holding a button when I can't take it anymore, I'm supposed to push it. And they're watching on a camera, of course. Well, at 8.3 Gs, it had squished all the blood out of my retina. So everything was black and, and I, I was having trouble breathing and they watched. I didn't want to push the button, but I was actually starting to pass out. So NASA stopped it. So I always thought I, I was the second highest on my crew. And I was proud of that until, you know, after my, my shuttle experience, I, I became chief scientist for the International Space Station in Washington, D.C. So I had, had to live there. And at that time, John Glenn, one of the first astronauts, was the senator. And I went to dinner with him. And, and he's just a wonderful guy. And I wanted to compare my training with him. And, and, and I asked him, you know, I, I said, John, I did 8.3 Gs in the centrifuge. What'd you do? And he didn't want to hurt my feelings. But he said, well, Larry, you know, I set the record for NASA 16 Gs for 40 seconds. And so <laughs> I always tell people I, I'm the wrong stuff. He's the right stuff. Oh my goodness! But, I have to tell you, I have a side connection to the space shuttle. My maternal uncle, yeah. his name was Dick Precourt, worked for Rockwell. Yeah, and he was a lead on the electrical engineering team around the shuttle's main uh, engines. And obviously, very proud of what his team did uh, over the years. Yeah. Um, when the shuttle started flying, um, the second flight was in '81. He acquired a silver satin flight jacket with the sts2 uh crew patch on it for engel and truly yes and he uh he gave that to his father who's my grandfather and he wore it all over small town wisconsin uh, and you know that was was quite a a feat for the american space you know uh systems to go from apollo and moon to putting these space shuttles these reusable aircrafts in space by the way uh, my uncle is not related to Charles Precourt, who flew on STS-55. I, I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might think that. Yeah. But I, I'm wondering if it's uh, if there's a, a fraternal or sort of a group 
sort of connection that that links those of you that are have been in the shuttle program now that it's it's behind us. They have uh, an astronaut reunion uh, every year. This year, because of COVID, they decided not to do it. Um, and and many times it's right there in Houston. Sometimes it'll be in a more exotic uh, location. I remember one, they, I couldn't go to this, but they did one, I think it was in Australia. So not many end up there, you know, but, but um, um, so there's that. Um, you know, one of the things I tell people that I never, you know, that you go through all this training, two years where you're training from early in the morning till sometimes you, you don't finish till 10 o'clock that night. Um, and, and meanwhile, you know, you have all these engineers at Cape Canaveral getting your shuttle ready for your flight. Um, so the morning that we had to walk out to get on the shuttle, no one told me that it was going to be like this. So we ate, you know, they tell you not to eat much. I wasn't afraid of getting sick. In fact, I gained three pounds in 14 days uh, while I was in flight. I just don't get sick. And but so I had a pretty good breakfast. But then I, I got my suit on and I'm walking out and they open these double doors. And there's all those engineers at six o'clock in the morning lined up on each side. And some of them had tears in their eyes cheering as we came out. It's amazing what it meant to those engineers to get that shuttle ready for us. Um, so I don't see many of them. Uh, I've gone back to the Cape a few times because I, my experiment went up. And so I'll go down there and, and try to connect with some of the people I knew. But I haven't seen many of them, unfortunately. Yeah, well, it's a it's a great time in American science and uh, you know aeronautics history to have had your your um, your participation. And uh, as we talk about space, the future of space is in front of us with what's going on on Mars. I know you continue to have some input on this, you know, the matter of being in space for a long time. You talked about the issue of you know how how, how lack of gravity affects us. What are some of the concerns you think will will be faced by the space exploration team? of the future on these longer duration missions. I mean, goodness, if we went to Mars, where are we headed? Yeah, the biggest concern right now, and, and it's still a red flag, and NASA is funding some groups trying to understand how, how to avoid this, is, is once you leave the protection we have from the Van Allen belts, uh, these, this is the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth. So when we fly on the shuttle, we're still within that, protected. Once you leave that, now you're be, being hit hit by all kinds of high energy particles that come from the sun and out in deep space. And they'll go right through the hull of the craft and they're gonna probably break up your DNA. So unless we can stop that, a trip to Mars takes about five months, five to six months. Um, you know, you're, you're gonna have people probably with cancer if we can't stop it. And so, so, you know, there's some amazing technology that is being explored right now. One is to create a magnetic field right around the craft as it heads toward Mars. Uh, that, that's one of the exciting ones. I think already the data shows it, it'll have potential to help. Won't completely eliminate it, but help. Um, and then they're coming up with new material, you know, that, you, that have, everything you do on a trip to Mars has to be lightweight. So imagine a coating or, a, or maybe a very thin shield they can help block some of those high energy particles. Lead doesn't do it. That thick of lead go right through it. And so it's uh it causes that's that's what's exciting about space research is it makes you think differently to develop new technologies that often will help us right here on Earth. Um, always does that. Um, it, you know, could you develop those technologies without ever going to space? Sure. Would we? Maybe not for another 50 years. So it really makes you think differently and have to explore new ways to, to achieve what we want. So that's the most, most pressing issue. But think about it. A trip to Mars, four of you in a little capsule, you're all healthy. The chance to, to go there, then you have to make fuel. Then you have to wait till Mars and Earth come back close together and then come back. The whole trip can take almost three years. So the chance that four healthy adults in in three years will need one of them will need tertiary care, maybe an appendix out is very high. And so what are you going to do? You can't robotically do it because to send a signal from here to Mars takes about 25 minutes. So that's not going to work. So you could send a physician. But what if the physician needs the surgery? So. You know, that's one problem. What about food and water? 
um, you know, you can't you can't take all the food and water you need for three years. The crap would be too heavy, you know, and need to be too too large. So that that Orion capsule that we're going to go there in, it's only about 15 feet in diameter and 12 and a half feet high, and put four wow. people in that, you know. So so you know what NASA has developed. Actually, when I was chief scientist, the first prototype they had developed um, to reuse our urine as drinking water, and uh, and uh, I was sitting in my office when I was chief scientist at headquarters, and uh, this friend of mine came in and said, Larry, are you thirsty? And I said, no, why? And he said, well, taste this water. It's great. Well, I just drank his urine that had been purified. <laughs> so, of course. But that that's now what we're having to do is how, how can we regenerate oxygen, you know, from the carbon dioxide we expel? All of that kind of technology is going to be used one day and is being used right now here in third world countries. So it's really uh, the, the technology that gets developed when you try to do something challenging like deep space flight uh, is just amazing. Well, that gets me to one other thing then. I guess I saw you in a junior college presentation on YouTube speak about the idea of harnessing solar power in space and then bringing it to the planet rather than harnessing it at the planet level. Does that have potential? Because I just saw a little story on CNN, I think, that said that there's already a, a small array up there testing the same. Yes. Does that have some potential for life here on Earth? Yes, it does. Um, you know, the, the reason it hasn't been done is we're all still paying for, for gasoline and using fossil fuel. One day, you know, whether we, you know, want to get away from that or, or can get away from that, um, we're going to need to do something like this. If you if you covered major miles and miles of Earth with solar panels, it won't it won't give us enough energy for more than about five percent of the world. You know, and you could have hundreds of miles of solar panels. Why is that? Well, here in Alabama, if I put solar panels on top of the roof of my house, we get daylight you know, only half the day, right? And clouds cover the sunlight. Um, so all that, you know, ends up, you really only get about three or four hours of really intense sunlight on those solar panel, panels per day, averaged out over the whole year. If you put a solar panel in geosynchronous orbit, so that's where our communication satellites are, and I'm talking about a big one, a solar panel, and this could be done, it's going to be expensive, and that's the reason it hasn't happened. But you could put a solar panel up there that's three miles across. If you did that, that solar panel would provide all the energy for everywhere in New York City, everything we need. So, and it's clean energy, right? It's coming from the sun. They're never the sun's never going to charge us more. Um, so the problem is to put that up would take several launches, and it would cost. The first one, it's estimated, would cost about a billion dollars. The next one would probably cost half that, you know, but to get the infrastructure, because because what that solar panel does is it captures the sunlight and you create it to a radial signal and beam it down into little little diode microarray on, on chicken wire. You could put it over a building and capture it, but the receptor on the ground, if, if what's up there is a mile, it's going to come down and spread a little bit. So the receptor has to be maybe a mile and a half. Um, so a big area. But it, and then you just convert it back to electricity. So what's, what's the efficiency of that? 97%. Wow. And, and you get sunlight in geosynchronous orbit all year, every day. Right. There's never clouds. And, and, you know, it might eventually from debris, there's not a lot in geosynchronous orbit, but, you know, it could be damaged a little, but it won't put it out. It might because you can build it with individual cells. And so if you had to repair it 10 years later, you could do that. So it has potential, but it's not going to happen until we really are serious about, you know, try to, trying to eliminate fossil fuel. And that, that's not going to happen for a while. Somewhere there is an optometrist listening, uh, who's or, or or who's got a, a young you know mentee that's going to want to be the person involved in the optics of that solar array panel yeah, and yeah. get involved in space like you have as an OD. Well, so yeah. just a few. Go yeah, ahead. I was just going to say with with the, all the developments in robotics and artificial intelligence, I think now 
we're not going to have to build it with people up there. I think it can all be done robotically. Um, and so it's very doable. It's just extremely expensive, and that's why it's not happening. So just a few more questions. Back to life on Earth. What, what gives you the most joy in life? <laughs> um, I think uh, still achieving something, discovering something that hasn't been. Um, you know, when I was at the university, I formed a company called Soluble Biotech. And, and that company kind of has moved along. And, and then uh, it was about in, in June or so of this year, it got acquired by a publicly traded company called Predictive Oncology. And they really liked our technology. And now I'm working part time, you know, not just with Aerospace Corporation on issues going one day to back to the moon and Mars, but also helping this company because what we do, we have a novel technique to develop the formulation around any protein therapeutic like the COVID vaccine. So you probably heard that the Pfizer vaccine, you know, now they've, they've come up with a new formulation where you don't have to keep it frozen at minus 80. Um, but all vaccines have to have what's called little small molecules called excipients that protect it, keep it stable at different temperatures. Um, that's what my company does. We do it, I think, much faster and, and uh, more efficiently than the competition. And so it really makes me feel good for a company to come to us, say, can you help us develop this vaccine? And we give them a formulation that they can go to the FDA and, and hopefully get it approved to to put into people one day. So it's it's uh, it's just great to see one of my ideas, you know, is is you know being used. That's awesome. And your kids saw you work your tail off to become a scientist, and so they're very accomplished, but they're not scientists. I assume they're all doing well. They are. Um, you know, my oldest son's a financial planner. Thank God, because I never really knew how to save money, and so he's helped me a lot for one day when I do retire. Um, my my younger boy is a physician's assistant and uh, doing very well. He graduated from Penn State in their school. Um, and then my daughter's a counselor. And uh, and the nice thing is two, two of them now have had children. So I have four grandchildren. So can't wait till I just had my first shot. When I get the second one, I'm planning to visit my grandchildren again. Just think about that from your science background and your love of optometry, because it helped you stay connected to people. What each of your kids have done is, is found a way to help others, to, to work with people. I, I just find that fascinating and inspiring. Yeah, it is. It really is. And, and what is your final thought as an optometrist to your colleagues in optometry about their future? So optometry is a profession. And, and as a profession, it's critical that you continue to expand that profession. If you're in a clinic, you know, doing case reports, any kind of clinical study is critical in optometry. If, if you like basic research, doing both with, with the clinic, I think it helps, you know, having both backgrounds, but all that is critical. And so to my colleagues, continue to expand what we do because that's the only way the profession is going to survive and, and really continue to be helpful. Because as new technologies come along, um, we need to be on the top of that and helping developing those. And I can vouch for that. I had a partner in practice by the name of Peter Bergensky, who was very academically and research minded, although he led a primary eye care practice to the community. Um, he was always involved in studies and he got me involved upon his retirement from practice in FDA clinical trials on contact lenses. I did not think that that was in my bailiwick. But what I learned is that the researchers need practicing doctors to be participants and Gosh, I learned so much about institutional review boards and principal investigators and things that are part of your life. And so I'll echo your request that doctors think about finding ways to get involved in academics. Being part of the AOA is important, but being part of the Academy of Optometry is important. And I'm just really thrilled to have been able to hear your stories about research and, and doing so many things to advance both of your professions. It's been a real pleasure telling your story. and. I can't wait to see you and talk to you another time. Thank well, you, you for you, all your enthusiasm. You can tell, Scott, I still get excited just talking about the whole space program. I can't help it. It, it was one of the most exciting uh, 
parts of my life. And so, uh, and, and it really did change my children. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it, even though they didn't become scientists, um, they, they wanted to excel at whatever they were doing. And I think it had a real influence on that. Well, we appreciate what you've done for optometry and for the scientific community. And uh, thank you so much for being a participant in Sandbox Stories. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it. And to the audience, thanks so much for attending and listening to these great stories. Until my next Sandbox Story, be great at all you do.